Today, nephrology stands at a critical crossroads. The COVID-19 pandemic and sweeping movements to advocate for racial equality have brought into focus the need for us, all of us, to take the lead and shape our future. Together, all of us must embrace three imperatives. We must improve practice to identify, slow, and ideally stop kidney diseases. We must advance science and medicine to treat and ultimately cure kidney diseases. We must enrich society by addressing health disparities and social determinants of health. If we accept these imperatives today, then in 2030, we will implement systems that value and advance our specialty and our contributions to public health, dismantle racism in nephrology, build a diverse and overflowing pipeline of students and trainees eager to cure kidney diseases, overcome the barriers social determinants of health impose on kidney care, secure the funding that will spur research, discovery, and innovation, as well as improve global health. Starting today, we must take the lead. Hello, I'm Sue Quaggan, the chair of this year's ASN's Award Selection Committee. It is my honor to present this year's Homer W. Smith Award. Established in 1964, this award recognizes an individual who has made outstanding contributions that have fundamentally changed the science of nephrology. ASN is proud to present this year's Homer W. Smith Award to Sir Peter Radcliffe, who will present on understanding cellular oxygen sensing mechanisms, implications for medicine. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. It, it is indeed a great honor to give this 2020 Homer Smith Award Lecture. Um, the work I'll describe and started with the kidney turned out to be a piece of general physiology, then has returned to kidney medicine in terms of therapeutics. Uh, and I'll try to take you through that story. So uh, here uh, you see my question uh, as a young nephrologist, this was my aim uh, to track the molecular pathway from erythropoietin uh, to oxygen. And I thought that that would be a, a very interesting piece of research. I was fascinated by the extraordinary sensitivity of the response. And we, um, the field, uh, believe that this will be a property of very special oxygen sensing cells in the kidney and liver uh, that make EPO. There was a new opportunity, of course, for this with the cloning of the erythropoietin gene in the mid 80s. Um, but uh, one obstacle uh, was the uh, absence at that time of cells in culture which made erythropoietin in an oxygen regulated way. Now that problem was solved by Franklin Bunn, who, who, who should be given a lot of credit for opening the field um, with uh, hepatoma cells, the other organ that makes EPO, uh, that enabled um, molecular dissection. And, and what I'm showing you here is the first part of that dissection that we uh, wish to define the oxygen regulated control sequences at the EPO locus uh, by transfection uh, in, into those cells. And that uh, piece I've shown you in, in, in black there turned out to be the key uh, sequence that regulates the EPO gene by oxygen. And here you see it displayed uh, by a reporter gene, alpha globin. Uh, it, when we have linked that small sequence to the alpha globin gene, we see the response to hypoxia, whereas the control you can see is is, is unresponsive. So that, that was the first step in our journey. Um, we immediately realized that this would open up a very interesting possibility. How would those cells behave in a non-EPO producing cell? And we, we made various attempts at that, but the, um, 
the, the really interesting experiment was, was this one, ultimately. Uh, I was keen to take a shortcut to the upstream oxygen sensing process. And I wanted to do this by uh, a, a technique uh, known as expression cloning, where we take the genetic elements from an oxygen sensitive cell, that was the cells identified by, by Frank Baum, uh, and transfer them into an oxygen insensitive cell, which I believe would be uh, practically uh, every other cell. Um, of course, I had to do a control experiment for that, make sure the oxygen sensitive uh, apparatus was not in the control cell. And here you see uh, that to our surprise and astonishment, uh, when we looked at it carefully, practically every cell uh, had that property. We, 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 they had nothing to do with making EPO, weren't from liver and kidney. So uh, clearly, of course, that was in a sense of frustration in that it destroyed my strategy. But we began to see the significance of this, that uh, by implication, uh, those cells must be doing something else with their oxygen sensing response. And of course, that would have, we believe, the extraordinary sensitivity of the erythropoietin gene. So evidence of a widespread system must be doing other things. And we began to dwell on the significance of that, wrote it up promptly, um, being uh, someone not to take chances. I drove with the manuscript to the offices of Nature magazine in, in London, anticipating that I could get into those offices, interview an editor who would immediately see uh, the importance of problem like myself uh, and agree to, to publish without much delay. Um, needless to say, it wasn't quite like that. And this is the response we got four months later. Um, of course, many scientists will have had this sort of disappointing letter. But what I want to draw your attention to, particularly the young people, is this thing. We had great difficulty in obtaining referees' reports. Yeah, actually, that's a good sign. Suggests you're in a new field. And of course, that's where you want to be uh, uh, as a young scientist. So this was, um, uh, in a sense, um, an experiment that changed my life in that we then began to be uh, interested in all sorts of other processes that were responsive to the same uh, molecular system as working on uh, erythropoietin. Um, the uh, protein binding that sequence, it, of course, was identified uh, by Greg Semenza and termed HIF. Um, we did these experiments more or less con uh, at the same time. And here, here's, I hope you like this photo of, of myself and Greg, uh, eagerly looking forward to the prospect of defining what it might be other than EPO that responds to this system. Uh, we were fortunate to identify the first genes. These were the phosphoglycerate kinase and LDH genes. And there you see HIF uh, binding to the phosphoglycerate kinase sequence. Of course, that implied perhaps a more basic and uh, more conserved function. And we looked for HIF here in, in insect cells, in Drosophila cells. Uh, and, and there you can see uh, the, the HIF in, in insect cells, which, of course, do not have a blood vascular system uh, as there is in uh, higher animals, do not have EPO. And of course, this opened the possibility that this was a widely conserved, widely operative uh, system. But I don't think Greg or I really anticipated the enormity of the HIF transcriptional response, which I've drawn out here, not just uh, directing erythropoiesis, angiogenesis, energy metabolism, things obviously connected with oxygen balance, but also uh, a lot of other rather peripherally concerned adaptive response to the immune system, development, cell migration, and so on and so forth. But I don't want to go through that at the moment because uh, our, our, our aim at the time was that upstream dissection. And uh, we, we did a, a rather similar type of experiment to the one I've shown you first uh, to try to define uh, portions of the HIF polypeptide uh, that would confer oxygen sensing uh, on a transcription reporter. Uh, and therefore must be uh, interfacing with the uh, signal and oxygen sensing system. Here I've shown you the summary of that work. We found 
three such sequences, in fact. Now, of course, everyone at the time knew that protein phosphorylation uh, was the uh, usual means of signal transduction. So we were um, looking for a, a protein phosphorylation consensus. Uh, rather oddly, we didn't see a consensus at all. And um, in the end, mutated every phosphoreceptor in this region uh, without um, uh, ablating the oxygen sensitive response. Uh, again, there was difficulty in publication. People said, well, that's all negative data. There's um, you know, no nothing um, uh, too interesting there. But of course, it did exclude the main hypothesis. There must be something else. So the question at the time, what was that? The clue um, came from human cancer genetics, uh, kidney cancer, uh, often associated with high red cell production and a very angiogenic tumor, which in the familial form causes these angiogenic eye lesions in von Hippel-Lindau disease, suggesting a connection with the uh, oxygen responsive genes that we defined. Now that connection was, was not made first by ourselves, that, that was uh, the work of Bill Kralin, Rick Klausner, uh, Mark Goldberg, and others, several groups reporting this, uh, but they didn't immediately see the mechanism. And we, we were able to do that, and this is the experiment, and this is a lesson to people, young people running a lab, we were able to make the connection to HIF because we had the best antibodies, and in fact, the only antibodies against if to alpha, uh, which brought this uh, experiment, you, you live for these eureka moments in, in science. Here you can see with total clarity uh, that in the VHL defective cells, the HIF is broadly similar, broadly stable, um, irrespective of oxygen. Whereas when we put VHL uh, back into those cells by transfection, we, uh, we constitute this enormous amplitude response. And that was uh, important as uh, fitted with the idea that VHL might be ubiquitin ligase. So we now had uh, this model that in the presence of oxygen, VHL would bind to HIF uh, and promote the destruction of the protein, uh, whereas in hypoxia, HIF would build up uh, and activate the uh, diverse transcriptional responses uh, that have just shown you. So, of course, now we had a clear path forwards. Um, what was it uh, about the uh, treatment of the HIF peptide? We, we worked out we had to treat, expose a HIF peptide to cell extract, and uh, then it would bind to VHL, which uh, in pure recombinant form, it, it wouldn't. So this is, of course, a classic biochemistry problem could we define the active principle in the cell extract that did that? And we formed a large number of biochemical experiments to demonstrate the heat mobility, to demonstrate that uh, this indeed did not require ATP, but did require oxygen. And eventually uh, we came by the idea that the modification was hydroxylation of a specific prolyl residue. And we had all sorts of different pieces of evidence to favor that, in, in, including the, the candidacy of prolyl hydroxylases in any case. Um, but this was one of, the, again, one of those moments you live for. Quite often, uh, these uh, predictions don't turn out to be correct when put to the test. But this was the acid test here. Uh, we made a hydroxylated peptide and you will see very clearly it did not require treatment with the extract. So that, that confirmed our data indicating that the event was prolyl hydroxylation at that site, which uh, of course was uh, very important in terms of suggesting an oxygen sensing mechanism. And um, we published this data back to back with uh, Bill Kalin, uh, and it essentially conceptualized the mechanism of oxygen sensing as likely being enzymatic prolyl hydroxylation. Now, prolyl hydroxylases were known in the setting of collagen modification as oxygen splitting enzymes. So they are, of course, a good candidate, but this sequence did not 
um, reflect or did not resemble the uh, collagen hydroxylation sites uh, and that possibility was excluded uh, for us by Johanna Mulleru. So what was the enzyme? I, I'd like to just take you through this um, a little bit more slowly um, because it illustrates how knowledge builds on knowledge in quite unexpected ways. Uh, so here was is my friend and colleague, uh, Christopher Schofield, um, working about a mile away in Oxford, not on oxygen sensing, but on antibiotic synthesis. Uh, now, Chris crystallized enzymes involved in, uh, in penicillin synthesis uh, and, and came by uh, this general structure of a beta bowel jelly roll with iron coordinated at these positions. And from structural similarities, um, he, he knew uh, that this structure uh, had some resemblance to the collagen prolyl hydroxylases and as the human genome was being decoded was able to predict the existence of 60 70 such enzymes which are two oxyglutarate dependent dioxygenases encoded by the human genome including many that might be candidate prolyl hydroxylases so that was one line of work at the same time, quite different, and we were quite unaware of this work when we started, of course, Bob Horowitz was cataloging mutant C. elegans, mutant nematode worms, which had specific uh, morphological defects. So this paper catalogues, I think, 149 such mutants which have difficulty in laying their eggs. And here is a worm with eggs retained within the body. And what could be the possible connection? Well, I'll move on. I explained that HIF was shown to be present in, in, in flies, so in the insects. Was it present in the nematode worm? Uh, again, uh, the key experiment involved making an antibody to the C. elegans protein, this experiment done by John O'Rourke in the lab, who simply uh, applied um, uh, hypoxia in a bell jar uh, to uh, demonstrate that the protein uh, which he'd identified and made an antibody to was indeed beautifully induced by hypoxia. So how did it come together? It turned out that some of Chris's predicted uh, prolyl hydroxylases corresponded to Bob Horowitz's mutants, uh, egg-laying egg deficient mutants. Uh, and, and here uh, was one of those moments, again, you live for, um, Andy Epstein, a student who did this bursting into, the off into my office saying, Egel 9, here's your gene. So here you can see three different mutant alleles of Egel 9. They all show constitutive stabilized HIF, as would the case if they were inactivating an oxygen-dependent prolyl hydroxylase. And we were, uh, of course, rapidly able to go on and show that Egel 9 did indeed encode a HIF prolyl hydroxylase. And, had in fact three human orthologs. So that, that's the that's the basic story um, summarized just in, 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 in this small diagram that there is a regulatory oxygenase which splits dioxygen and places one oxygen atom uh, on the prolyl residue of HIF to create an alcohol group here, which hydrogen bonds to the von Hippolino tumor suppressor to destroy HIF. Uh, in, in the presence of, of oxygen. Um, uh, as, as Thomas Perlman uh, pointed out, uh, in, in Stockholm last year uh, at the Nobel uh, celebrations, well, it's rather obvious, really, um, an oxygen splitting enzyme might be anticipated to do this. Uh, but the truth is um, it wasn't anticipated. And um, it, in fact, practically every type of iron-containing enzymes except this class uh, of enzyme had been proposed. Um, this was a new and unprecedented signaling mechanism at the time. But it turns out since then, um, rather to our surprise, where well, we were first surprised the system was, was widespread in, in human and animal cells, then we were surprised that it wasn't present um, since oxygen homeostasis is required across all kingdoms of life, that it wasn't present in non-animal species. Uh, but look at this. This is work that's come to light since then. This is our system in animal cells. 
This is the system in protists that is rather similar, again, using a prolyl 4 hydroxylase. This is a system in fission yeast, which uh, alters a sterile response, uses the prolyl 3 hydroxylase. In each case, this is enzymatic uh, protein oxidation uh, triggering for proteolysis. Um, but the one that um, perhaps the most interesting, plants use a different type of oxygenase, cysteine oxidases, to modify cysteine residue in position two of the polypeptide, uh, which is uncovered by uh, methionine aminopeptidases, uh, uh, and then targets the protein degradation by the N-degron pathway. So we've been interested in whether any of these systems actually have a, a human orthologue. And we, we sought to test the, the plant system as it, it's the most different. And uh, here is a plant sequence coupled to a reporter gene. And this is the behavior of that uh, reporter gene uh, fusion uh, in human cells. And you, you can see the striking regulation by hypoxia. Uh, and this is the process uh, when we've mutated that cysteine. So uh, beyond the HIF system now, and this is ongoing work, uh, we believe that this is a rather general process of enzymatic protein oxidation, triggering uh, for degradation, which has more than one representation in human biology. And this is the second, second one. We were able to identify the enzyme as being similar to the plant cysteine oxidases found by uh, Francesco Lacosi. Uh, and this is an experiment done by Francesco where the mutant plant, which is deficient in the plant oxygen sensor, is, is beautifully complemented uh, by addition of the human oxygen sensor. Uh, you may ask, what does this do beyond what, uh, what we've uh, discovered for HIF in human cells? Uh, and this is an exemplar, uh, again, work uh, ongoing, uh, that uh, in this ADO knockout cell, uh, we see upregulation of a regulator of G-protein signaling, uh, uh, and in those knockout cells, uh, a, 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 a dysregulation of G-protein signaling. So that, we believe, um, we have the HIF system, we're going to have other systems, and that uh, human oxygen homeostasis, perhaps unsurprisingly, uh, will ultimately be delivered by a complex interplay of several different processes. So against that background, I, I want to finish um, uh, the second part of the lecture with a consideration of therapeutics. And uh, of course, I know that m most of you will be nephrologists and interested in, in whether now uh, these discoveries can be used for therapy in nephrology. Um, of course, the use of 2-oxaglutarate by the enzyme as co-substrates makes a perfect drug target since an analog will block the catalytic mechanism mimic hypoxia uh, and therefore uh, trick the cell into believing it's hypoxic when it isn't to make the adaptive response that's appropriate. So is, is this then a panacea given all these possible uh, outflows or a problem? Um, of course, what we would like to do is induce erythropoiesis in our kidney patients uh, without all these other uh, um, mechanisms. And the question is, will that be possible and how would it work? If you look at the potential targets of the HIF system, of course, we could do a lot of bad things um, and generate angiogenesis when we don't want it and so on and so forth. Or we could do a lot of useful things alongside uh, induction of erythropoiesis. The question is, what would happen actually in clinical practice? Because none of the genetic and preclinical animal models really predict clinical practice where, of course, dose is paramount. Many people will be familiar with the recent Japanese alongside uh, Chinese uh, uh, licensing uh, here in Japan of, of, of two agents uh, compared in phase three trials with adabitopoietin uh, alpha. And you can see they, they demonstrate non-inferiority. Uh, over the uh, six month or 12 month duration of these studies without very obvious uh, effects outside 
uh, erythropoiesis. Now, there, there are a few caveats to this. The, the trials are not powered, really, to discover other effects. Uh, and, of course, they involve a dose titration. So although these agents are apparently similar, uh, there may be quite substantial differences in the effect to which, in, by, in, in which they affect non-erythropoietic uh, um, processes uh, that will require longer and larger trials to uncover. Uh, but at the moment, uh, a lot of the reports have focused on, on whether there might be uh, significant advantages of this sort of treatment over erythropoietin. And, um, and several have drawn attention the, the possibility that HIF uh, activates a number of proteins involved in transport of iron uptake and iron delivery that might support erythropoiesis uh, more effectively uh, than uh, induction through EPO. And um, I think uh, clinically the, drug, the, the jury is still a little bit out, although the trials do suggest that very commonly uh, hemoglobin can be improved without the need for intravenous iron. And when the nephrologist has been blind to use to the, 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 the trial and able to use the IV iron in whatever they wish, where they wish, then a slightly less um, intravenous iron has been required. So a potential advantage there. Uh, they have probably other actions on erythropoiesis, so would they be more broadly effective? I, I think the jury's still out, although there is some promising hints that they might be more effective than erythropoietin in, in, in people where the response to EPO is restrained by inflammation. They certainly produce erythropoiesis without the very high levels uh, of serum EPO from uh, senior recombinant uh, epotherapy. Effects on cholesterol metabolism, I, I think this is uh, mechanistically pretty solid, but uh, if induces these INSIG proteins, which are involved in the degradation of HMG-CoA reductase, uh, and, and therefore essentially reduce the activity of that enzyme and reduce cholesterol synthesis. Uh, and, and there is a signal of cholesterol reduction in the trials, which I, I think is sufficient to be uh, of, of significant advantage. Of course, the drugs could be applied in cases of statin resistance, since they will degrade an enzyme which, which is uh, still being operative in the face of, of, of statin therapy. Um, so it, it, in, in the final few minutes, I'd like to just consider two questions. Um, one, Assuming that it turns out to be true that relatively selective induction of EPO uh, by the uh, polar hydroxylase is, is possible, why would that be? Um, well, first, the drugs are concentrated in EPO-producing organs, the liver and kidney. Uh, secondly, there might be uh, pharmacodynamic effects. Um, the very long red cell lifespan might essentially integrate very intermittent drug action. There might be some uh, HIF uh, target gene selectivity, or, or, although I don't think the current agents are very selective. Uh, but the one I want to just take you through uh, for interest in relation to nephrology is the unique anatomy of the kidney responsible for very high amplitude regulation of EPO uh, and therefore in itself uh, capable of explaining why these drugs seem to be so very effective. Now, in the, in the, in the kidney, uh, people will be aware that vessels run countercurrent. And actually, this is also uh, the, these great and oxygen grading, which are actually also true in, in the liver in, in relation to EPO producing cells across the lobule of the liver. So, as we become more anemic, um, we, we see that there is a march by which progressively more EPO producing cells um, are induced to make. EPO uh, as they become uh, hypoxic. So this march is amplifying the intrinsic cellular uh, sensitivity of HIF. Of course, if we add a pharmacological inhibitor, uh, we might not be constrained by this pattern of intravenal oxygenation. So we can essentially access uh, a very large number of cells that have EPO uh, production. In the diseased kidney, uh, of course, that, that march of increasing numbers of EPO cells might be perturbed 
by the abnormal intrarenal environment. But again, when we come to use uh, a pharmacological agent, we might not be constrained by that intrarenal oxygen gradient and able to access many cells, which might, in fact, since these are the interstitial fibroblasts that are present in diseased kidneys, be even more than the normal kidney. So I'll leave you with that slightly provocative note and ask finally whether we might do better, whether the in, in, in current inhibitors in clinical trials are the last word. What I'm showing at the top here is the extraordinary high level of HIF2 alpha, one isoform of the HIF system, in the EPO producing cells within the kidney. Here the protein, here's the mRNA. EPO is a, broadly speaking, a specific HIF2 target. So would it be possible to make a HIF2 inhibitor? Uh, th this is data from my colleague Chris Schofield, NMR data, showing that when the prolyl hydroxylase enzymes interact with specific HIF peptides, they do so in a substrate-specific way, i.e., broadly speaking, the blue bits are different from the red bits. That's all we really need to know. These are NMR signals, and they suggest the possibility that you could make a substrate-specific inhibitor. As far as we can see, um, the current inhibitors uh, are not specific. They are, broadly speaking, inducing HIF-1 and HIF-2. Perhaps unsurprisingly, uh, they might apparently look rather different in structure, uh, but when you drill down on it, they all have this moiety, uh, and they are all pretty well non-specific uh, inhibitors of HIF-1 and HIF-2 uh, uh, and across the different human hif prolyl hydroxylase inhibitors. Might they nevertheless be differentiated? Well, as I've alluded to, I think a key issue is exactly how they're handled in the kidney and liver, and it may very well be that pharmacokinetic principles dictate which one of these drugs has relatively higher or lower uh, non-EPO action when it's used clinically. So uh, to conclude, um, science and medicine in the 21st century, uh, I'm aware of uh, Homer Smith's uh, ventures into philosophy uh, and Darwinian evolution. Uh, can we, with molecular analysis, actually deliver precision medicine? Or is Darwinian evolution so complicated, is everything so interconnected that we could never do that? So do we need precision medicine or are we still reliant on clinical pharmacology? And I would argue here that this is a piece of molecular reductionist biology that does deliver a, a, a rather precise solution to this, but we will still need clinical pharmacology to go carefully through dose pharmacokinetics to derive the safe clinical result that we all desire. I've finished there. Um, the, thanks to many people who've been with me uh, through those years. The current uh, group in, in red there, here they are on a sunny day in Oxford. Uh, and uh, thanks also to my uh, funders who supported this work generally, generously over the years. Thank you very much.